Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 12 Brute Neighbors Sometimes I had a companion in my fishing, who came through the village to my house from the other side of town, and the catching of the dinner was as much a social exercise as the eating of it. Hermit I wonder what the world is doing now. I have not heard so much as a locust over the sweet fern these three hours. The pigeons are all asleep upon their roosts. No flutter from them. Was that a farmer's noon horn which sounded from beyond the woods just now? The hands are coming in to boiled salt beef and cider and Indian bread. Why will men worry themselves so? He that does not eat need not work. I wonder how much they have reaped. Who would live there where a body can never think for the barking of bows? And, oh, the housekeeping! To keep bright the devil's doorknobs and scour his tubs this bright day better not keep a house. Say, some hollow tree, and then for morning calls and dinner parties, only a woodpecker tapping. Oh, they swarm, the sun is too warm there, they are born too far into life for me. I have water from the spring, and a loaf of brown bread on the shelf. Hark! I hear a rustling of the leaves. Is it some ill-fed village hound yielding to the instinct of the chase? Or the lost pig which is said to be in these woods, whose tracks I saw after the rain? It comes on apace. My sumacs and sweetbriars tremble. Eh? Mr. Poet, is it you? How do you like the world today? Poet, see those clouds, how they hang. That's the greatest thing I have seen today. There's nothing like it in old paintings, nothing like it in foreign lands, unless when we were off the coast of Spain. That's a true Mediterranean sky. I thought as I have my living to get, and have not eaten today, that I might go a-fishing. That's the true industry for poets. It is the only trade I have learned. Come, let's along. Hermit, I cannot resist. My brown bread will soon be gone. I will go with you gladly soon. But I am just concluding a serious meditation. I think that I am near the end of it. Leave me alone, then, for a while. But that we may not be delayed, you shall be digging the bait, meanwhile. Angleworms are rarely to be met with in these parts where the soil was never fattened with manure. The race is nearly extinct. The sport of digging the bait is nearly equal to that of catching the fish, when one's appetite is not too keen, and this you may have all to yourself today. I would advise you to set in the spade down yonder, among the ground-nuts, where you see the johnswort waving, I think that I may warrant you one worm to every three sods you turn up. If you look well in among the roots of the grass, as if you were weeding, or if you choose to go farther it will not be unwise. For I have found the increase of fair bait to be very nearly as the squares of the distances. Hermit Alone let me see, where was I? Methinks I was nearly in this frame of mind. The world lay about at this angle. Shall I go to heaven, or a fishing? If I should soon bring this meditation to an end, would another so sweet occasion be likely to offer? I was as near being resolved into the essence of things as ever I was in my life. I fear my thoughts will not come back to me. 
if it would do any good I would whistle for them. When they make us an offer, is it wise to say, we will think of it? My thoughts have left no track, and I cannot find the path again. What was it that I was thinking of? It was a very hazy day. I will just try these three sentences of Confuci. They may fetch that state about again. I know not whether it was the dumps or a budding ecstasy. Mem, there never is but one opportunity of a kind. Poet, how now, hermit? Is it too soon? I have got just thirteen whole ones, besides several which are imperfect or undersized, but they will do for the smaller fry. They do not cover up the hook so much. Those village worms are quite too large. A shiner may make a meal of one without finding the skewer. Hermit. Well, then, let's be off. Shall we to Concord? There's good sport there if the water be not too high. Why do precisely these objects which we behold make a world? Why has man just these species of animals for his neighbors, as if nothing but a mouse could have filled this crevice? I suspect that Pilpe and company have put animals to their best use, for they are all beasts of burden in a sense, made to carry some portion of our thoughts. The mice which haunted my house were not the common ones, which are said to have been introduced into the country, but a wild native kind not found in the village. I sent one to a distinguished naturalist, and it interested him much. When I was building, one of these had its nest underneath the house, and before I had laid the second floor, and swept out the shavings, would come out regularly at lunchtime and pick up the crumbs at my feet. It probably had never seen a man before, and it soon became quite familiar, and would run over my shoes and up my clothes. It could readily ascend the sides of the room by short impulses like a squirrel, which it resembled in its motions. At length, as I leaned with my elbow on the bench one day, it ran up my clothes and along my sleeve, and round and round the paper which held my dinner, while I kept the latter close and dodged and played at bo-peep with it. And when at last I held still a piece of cheese between my thumb and finger, it came and nibbled it, sitting in my hand, and afterward cleaned its face and paws, like a fly, and walked away. A Phoebe soon built in my shed, and a robin for protection in a pine which grew against the house. In June the partridge, Tetrao umbellus, which is so shy a bird, led her brood past my windows, from the woods in the rear to the front of my house, plucking and calling to them like a hen, and in all her behavior proving herself the hen of the woods. The young suddenly disperse on your approach at a signal from the mother, as if a whirlwind had swept them away, and they so exactly resemble the dried leaves and twigs that many a traveller has placed his foot in the midst of a brood, and heard the whirr of the old bird as she flew off, and her anxious calls and mewing, or seen her trail her wings to attract his attention without suspecting their neighborhood. The parent will sometimes roll and spin round before you in such a dishabille that you cannot for a few moments detect what kind of creature it is. The young squat, still and flat, often running their heads under a leaf, and mind only their mother's directions given from a distance, nor will your approach make them run again and betray themselves. You may even tread on them, or have your eyes on them for a minute without discovering them. 
I have held them in my open hand at such a time, and still their only care, obedient to their mother and their instinct, was to squat there without fear or trembling. So perfect is this instinct, that once when I had lain them on the leaves again, and one accidentally fell on its side, it was found with the rest in exactly the same position ten minutes afterward. They are not callow like the young of most birds, but more perfectly developed and precocious even than chickens. The remarkably adult yet innocent expression of their open and serene eyes is very memorable. All intelligence seems reflected in them. They suggest not merely the purity of infancy, but a wisdom clarified by experience. Such an eye was not born when the bird was, but is coeval with the sky it reflects. The woods do not yield another such a gem. The traveler does not often look into such a limpid well. The ignorant or reckless sportsman often shoots the parent at such a time, and leaves these innocents to fall a prey to some prowling beast or bird, or gradually mingle with the decaying leaves which they so much resemble. It is said that when hatched by a hen they will directly disperse on some alarm, and so are lost, for they never hear the mother's call which gathers them again. These were my hens and chickens. It is remarkable how many creatures live wild and free, though secret in the woods, and still sustain themselves in the neighborhood of towns, suspected by hunters only. How retired the otter manages to live here! He grows to be four feet long, as big as a small boy, perhaps without any human being getting a glimpse of him. I formerly saw the raccoon in the woods, behind where my house is built, and probably still heard their winnering at night. Commonly I rested an hour or two in the shade at noon, after planting, and ate my lunch, and read a little by a spring which was the source of a swamp and of a brook, oozing from under Brister's Hill, half a mile from my field. The approach to this was through a succession of descending grassy hollows, full of young pitch pines, into a larger wood about the swamp. There in a very secluded and shaded spot, under a spreading white pine, there was yet a clean, firm sward to sit on. I had dug out the spring and made a well of clear gray water, where I could dip up a pailful without roiling it. And thither I went for this purpose almost every day in midsummer, when the pond was warmest. Thither, too, the woodcock led her brood, to probe the mud for worms, flying but a foot above them down the bank while they ran in a troop beneath but at last, spying me, she would leave her young and circle round and round me, nearer and nearer till within four or five feet, pretending broken wings and legs to attract my attention and get off her young, who would already have taken up their march with faint, wiry peep, single file through the swamp as she directed or I heard the peep of the young when I could not see the parent bird. There, too, the turtle-doves sat over the spring, or fluttered from bough to bough of the soft white pines over my head, or the red squirrel, coursing down the nearest bough, was particularly familiar and inquisitive. You only need sit still long enough in some attractive spot in the woods that all its inhabitants may exhibit themselves to you by turns. I was witness to events of a less peaceful character. 
One day, when I went out to my woodpile, or rather my pile of stumps, I observed two large ants, the one red, the other much larger, nearly half an inch long and black, fiercely contending with one another. Having once got hold, they never let go, but struggled and wrestled and rolled on the chips incessantly. Looking farther, I was surprised to find that the chips were covered with such combatants, that it was not a dulum, but a bellum, a war between two races of ants, the red always pitted against the black, and frequently two red ones to one black. The legions of these myrmidons covered all the hills and vales in my woodyard, and the ground was already strewn with the dead and dying, both red and black. It was the only battle which I have ever witnessed, the only battlefield I ever trod while the battle was raging. Internecine war. The red republicans on the one hand, and the black imperialists on the other. On every side they were engaged in deadly combat, yet without any noise that I could hear and human soldiers never fought so resolutely. I watched a couple that were fast locked in each other's embraces, in a little sunny valley amid the chips, now at noonday prepared to fight till the sun went down or life went out. The smaller red champion had fastened himself like a vice to his adversary's front, and through all the tumblings on that field never for an instant ceased to gnaw at one of his feelers near the root, having already caused the other to go by the board, while the stronger black one dashed him from side to side, and, as I saw on looking nearer, had already divested him of several of his members. They fought with more pertinacity than bulldogs, neither manifested the least disposition to retreat. It was evident that their battle cry was conquer or die. In the meanwhile, there came along a single red ant on the hillside of this valley, evidently full of excitement, who either had dispatched his foe or had not yet taken part in the battle, probably the latter, for he had lost none of his limbs, whose mother had charged him to return with his shield or upon it. Or, perchance, he was some Achilles, who had nourished his wrath apart, and had now come to avenge or rescue his Patroclus. He saw this unequal combat from afar, for the blacks were nearly twice the size of the red. He drew near with rapid pace, till he stood on his guard within half an inch of the combatants. Then, watching his opportunity, he sprang upon the black warrior, and commenced his operations near the root of his right foreleg, leaving the foe to select among his own members. And so there were three united for life, as if a new kind of attraction had been invented which put all other locks and cements to shame. I should not have wondered by this time to find that they had their respective musical bands stationed on some eminent chip, and playing their national airs the while, to excite the slow and cheer the dying combatants. I was myself excited, and somewhat even as if they had been men. The more you think of it, the less the difference. And certainly there is not the fight recorded in Concord history, at least, if in the history of America, that will bear a moment's comparison with this, whether for the numbers engaged in it, or for the patriotism and heroism displayed. For numbers and for carnage it was an Austerlitz, or Dresden, Concord fight. 
two killed on the Patriot's side, and Luther Blanchard wounded. Why, here every ant was a buttrick. Fire! For God's sake, fire! And thousands shared the fate of Davis and Hosmer. There was not one hireling there. I have no doubt that it was a principle they fought for, as much as our ancestors, and not to avoid a three-penny tax on their tea. And the results of this battle will be as important and memorable to those whom it concerns as those of the Battle of Bunker Hill, at least. I took up the chip on which the three I have particularly described were struggling, carried it into my house and placed it under a tumbler on my window-sill in order to see the issue. Holding a microscope to the first-mentioned red ant, I saw that, though he was assiduously gnawing at the near foreleg of his enemy, having severed his remaining feeler, his own breast was all torn away, exposing what vitals he had there to the jaws of the black warrior, whose breastplate was apparently too thick for him to pierce, and the dark carbuncles of the sufferer's eyes shone with ferocity such as war only could excite. They struggled half an hour longer under the tumbler, and when I looked again, the black soldier had severed the heads of his foes from their bodies, and the still-living heads were hanging on either side of him like ghastly trophies at his saddle-bow, still apparently as firmly fastened as ever, and he was endeavouring with feeble struggles, being without feelers and with only the remnant of a leg, and I know not how many other wounds, to divest himself of them, which at length, after half an hour more, he accomplished. I raised the glass, and he went off over the window-sill in that crippled state. Whether he finally survived that combat, and spent the remainder of his days in some hôtel des Invalides, I do not know. But I thought that his industry would not be worth much thereafter. I never learned which party was victorious, nor the cause of the war, but I felt for the rest of that day as if I had had my feelings excited and harrowed by witnessing the struggle, the ferocity, and carnage of a human battle before my door. Kirby and Spence tell us that the battles of ants have long been celebrated and the date of them recorded, though they say that Huber is the only modern author who appears to have witnessed them. Aeneas Silvius, say they, after giving a very circumstantial account of one contested with great obstinacy by a great and small species on the trunk of a pear tree, adds that this action was fought in the pontificate of Eugenius the Fourth, in the presence of Nicholas Pistorianus, an eminent lawyer who related the whole history of the battle with the greatest fidelity. A similar engagement between great and small ants is recorded by Olaus Magnus, in which the small ones, being victorious, are said to have buried the bodies of their own soldiers, but left those of their giant enemies a prey to the birds. This event happened previous to the expulsion of the tyrant Christiern II from Sweden. The battle which I witnessed took place in the presidency of Polk, five years before the passage of Webster's Fugitive Slave Bill. Many a village boasts, fit only to course a mud turtle in a victualling cellar, sported his heavy quarters in the woods without the knowledge of his master, and ineffectually smelled at old fox-burrows and woodchuck's holes, led perchance by some slight cur which nimbly threaded the wood, and might still inspire a natural terror in its denizens. Now far behind his guide, barking like a canine bull toward some small squirrel, which had treated itself for scrutiny, then cantering off, bending the bushes with his weight, 
imagining that he is on the track of some stray member of the Gerbilla family. Once I was surprised to see a cat walking along the stony shore of the pond, for they rarely wander so far from the home. The surprise was mutual. Nevertheless, the most domestic cat, which has lain on a rug all her days, appears quite at home in the woods, and, by her sly and stealthy behavior, proves herself more native there than the regular inhabitants. Once, when burying, I met with a cat with young kittens in the woods, quite wild, and they all, like their mother, had their backs up and were fiercely spitting at me. A few years before I lived in the woods, there was what was called a winged cat in one of the farmhouses in Lincoln nearest the pond, Mr. Gillian Baker's. When I called to see her in June, 1842, she was gone a-hunting in the woods as was her wont. I am not sure whether it was a male or female, and so use the more common pronoun. But her mistress told me that she came into the neighborhood a little more than a year before, in April, and was finally taken into their house. That she was of a dark, brownish-gray color, with a white spot on her throat, and white feet, and had a large, bushy tail like a fox. That in the winter the fur grew thick and flatted out along her sides, forming stripes ten or twelve inches long by two and a half wide, and under her chin like a muff. The upper side loose, the under matted like felt, and in the spring these appendages dropped off. They gave me a pair of her wings, which I keep still. There is no appearance of a membrane about them. Some thought it was part flying squirrel or some other wild animal, which is not impossible, for according to naturalists prolific hybrids have been produced by the union of the marten and domestic cat. This would have been the right kind of cat for me to keep, if I had kept any, for why should not a poet's cat be winged as well as his horse? In the fall the loon, Columbus Glacialis, came, as usual, to molt and bathe in the pond, making the woods ring with his wild laughter before I had risen. At rumor of his arrival all the mill-dam sportsmen are on the alert, in gigs and on foot, two by two and three by three, with patent rifles and conical balls and spy-glasses. They come rustling through the woods like autumn leaves, at least ten men to one loon. Some station themselves on this side of the pond, some on that, for the poor bird cannot be omnipresent. If he dive here, he must come up there. But now the kind October wind rises, rustling the leaves and rippling the surface of the water, so that no loon can be heard or seen, though his foes sweep the pond with spy-glasses, and make the woods resound with their discharges. The waves generously rise and dash angrily, taking sides with all waterfowl, and our sportsmen must beat a retreat to town, and shop, and unfinished jobs. But they were too often successful. When I went to get a pail of water early in the morning I frequently saw this stately bird sailing out of my cove within a few rods. If I endeavored to overtake him in a boat in order to see how he would maneuver, he would dive and be completely lost, so that I did not discover him again, sometimes, till the latter part of the day. But I was more than a match for him on the surface. He commonly went off in a rain. As I was paddling along the north shore one very calm October afternoon, for such days especially they settle on to the lakes, like the milkweed down, having looked in vain over the pond for a loon, suddenly one, sailing out from the shore toward the middle, a few rods in front of me, 
set up his wild laugh and betrayed himself. I pursued with a paddle, and he dived, but when he came up I was nearer than before. He dived again, but I miscalculated the direction he would take, and we were fifty rods apart when he came to the surface this time, for I had helped to widen the interval, and again he laughed, long and loud, and with more reason than before. He maneuvered so cunningly that I could not get within half a dozen rods of him. Each time when he came to the surface, turning his head this way and that, he coolly surveyed the water and the land, and apparently chose his course so that he might come up where there was the widest expanse of water and at the greatest distance from the boat. It was surprising how quickly he made up his mind and put his resolve into execution. He led me at once to the widest part of the pond, and could not be driven from it. While he was thinking one thing in his brain, I was endeavoring to divine his thought in mine. It was a pretty game, played on the smooth surface of the pond, a man against a loon. Suddenly your adversary's checker disappears beneath the board, and the problem is to place yours nearest to where his will appear again. Sometimes he would come up unexpectedly on the opposite side of me, having apparently passed directly under the boat. So long-winded was he, and so unweariable, that when he had swum farthest he would immediately plunge again, nevertheless, and then no wit could divine where in the deep pond, beneath the smooth surface, he might be speeding his way like a fish for he had time and ability to visit the bottom of the pond in its deepest part. It is said that loons have been caught in the New York lakes, eighty feet beneath the surface, with hooks set for trout, though Walden is deeper than that. How surprised must the fishes be to see this ungainly visitor from another sphere speeding his way amid their schools! yet he appeared to know his course as surely under water as on the surface, and swam much faster there. Once or twice I saw a ripple where he approached the surface, just put his head out to reconnoiter, and instantly dived again. I found that it was as well for me to rest on my oars and wait his reappearing as to endeavor to calculate where he would rise for again and again, when I was straining my eyes over the surface one way, I would suddenly be startled by his unearthly laugh behind me. But why, after displaying so much cunning, did he invariably betray himself the moment he came up by that loud laugh? Did not his white breast enough betray him? He was indeed a silly loon, I thought. I could commonly hear the splash of the water when he came up, and so also detected him. But after an hour he seemed as fresh as ever, dived as willingly, and swam yet farther than at first. It was surprising to see how serenely he sailed off with unruffled breast when he came to the surface, doing all the work with his webbed feet beneath. His usual note was this demoniac laughter, yet somewhat like that of a waterfowl. But occasionally, when he had balked me most successfully, and come up a long way off, he uttered a long-drawn, unearthly howl, probably more like that of a wolf than any bird, as when a beast puts his muzzle to the ground and deliberately howls. This was his looning, perhaps the wildest sound that is ever heard here, making the woods ring far and wide. I concluded that he laughed in derision of my efforts, confident of his own resources. Though the sky was by this time overcast, the pond was so smooth that I could see where he broke the surface when I did not hear him his white breast, the stillness of the air, and the smoothness of the water were all against him. 
At length, having come up fifty rods off, he uttered one of those prolonged howls, as if calling on the god of loons to aid him. And immediately there came a wind from the east, and rippled the surface, and filled the whole air with misty rain, and I was impressed as if it were the prayer of the loon answered, and his god was angry with me. And so I left him, disappearing far away on the tumultuous surface. For hours in fall days I watched the ducks cunningly tack and veer and hold the middle of the pond, far from the sportsmen, tricks which they will have less need to practice in Louisiana bayous. When compelled to rise they would sometimes circle round and round and over the pond at a considerable height, from which they could easily see to other ponds in the river, like black motes in the sky. And when I thought they had gone off thither long since, they would settle down by a slanting flight of a quarter of a mile on to a distant part which was left free. But what, besides safety, they got by sailing in the middle of Walden, I do not know, unless they love its water for the same reason that I do. End of chapter 12 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 13 House Warming In October I went a-graping to the river meadows, and loaded myself with clusters more precious for their beauty and fragrance than for food. There, too, I admired, though I did not gather, the cranberries, small waxen gems, pendants of the meadow-grass, pearly and red, which the farmer plucks with an ugly rake, leaving the smooth meadow in a snarl heedlessly measuring them by the bushel and the dollar only, and sells the spoils of the meads to Boston and New York. Destined to be jammed, to satisfy the tastes of lovers of nature there. So butchers rake the tongues of bison out of the prairie grass, regardless of the torn and drooping plant. The barberry's brilliant fruit will likewise food for my eyes merely. But I collected a small store of wild apples for codling, which the proprietor and travelers had overlooked. When chestnuts were ripe I laid up half a bushel for winter. It was very exciting at that season to roam the then boundless chestnut woods of Lincoln. They now sleep their long sleep under the railroad with a bag on my shoulder, and a stick to open burrs with in my hand, for I did not always wait for the frost. Amid the rustling of leaves and the loud reproofs of the red squirrels and the jays, whose half-consumed nuts I sometimes stole, for the burrs which they had selected were sure to contain sound ones. Occasionally I climbed and shook the trees. They grew also behind my house, and one large tree which almost overshadowed it was, when in flower, a bouquet which scented the whole neighborhood, but the squirrels and the jays got most of its fruit. The last coming in flocks early in the morning, and picking the nuts out of the burrs before they fell, I relinquished these trees to them, and visited the more distant woods, composed wholly of chestnut. Many other substitutes might, perhaps, be found. Digging one day for fishworms, I discovered the ground nut, Apios tuberosa, on its string, the potato of the aborigines, a sort of fabulous fruit, which I had begun to doubt if I had ever dug and eaten in childhood, as I had told, and had not dreamed it. I had often seen its crumpled red velvety blossom supported by the stems of other plants, without knowing it to be the same. Cultivation has well-nigh exterminated it. 
It has a sweetish taste, much like that of a frost-bitten potato, and I found it better boiled than roasted. This tuber seemed like a faint promise of nature to rear her own children and feed them simply here at some future period. In these days of fatted cattle and waving grain fields, this humble root, which was once the totem of an Indian tribe, is quite forgotten, or known only by its flowering vine. But let wild nature reign here once more, and the tender and luxurious English grains will probably disappear before a myriad of foes, and without the care of man the crow may carry back even the last seed of corn to the great cornfield of the Indian's god in the southwest, whence he is said to have brought it. But the now almost exterminated ground-nut will perhaps revive and flourish in spite of frosts and wildness, prove itself indigenous, and resume its ancient importance and dignity as the diet of the hunter tribe. Some Indian Ceres or Minerva must have been the inventor and bestower of it, and when the reign of poetry commences here, its leaves and string of nuts may be represented on our works of art. Already by the first of September I had seen two or three small maples turned scarlet across the pond, beneath where the white stems of three aspens diverged, at the point of a promontory next the water. Ah, many a tale their color told, and gradually from week to week the character of each tree came out, and it admired itself reflected in the smooth mirror of the lake. Each morning the manager of this gallery substituted some new picture, distinguished by more brilliant or harmonious coloring, for the old upon the walls. The wasps came by thousands to my lodge in October, as to winter quarters, and settled on my windows within, and on the walls overhead, sometimes deterring visitors from entering. Each morning, when they were numbed with cold, I swept some of them out, but I did not trouble myself to get rid of them. I even felt complimented by their regarding my house as a desirable shelter. They never molested me seriously, though they bedded with me, and they gradually disappeared, into what crevices I do not know, avoiding winter and unspeakable cold. Like the wasps, before I finally went into winter quarters in November, I used to resort to the northeast side of Walden, which the sun, reflected from the pitch-pine woods in the stony shore, made the fireside of the pond. It is so much pleasanter and wholesomer to be warmed by the sun while you can be than by an artificial fire. I thus warmed myself by the still glowing embers which the summer, like a departed hunter, had left. When I came to build my chimney, I studied masonry. My bricks, being second-hand ones, required to be cleaned with a trowel, so that I learned more than usual of the qualities of bricks and trowels. The mortar on them was fifty years old, and was said to be still growing harder. But this is one of those sayings which men love to repeat whether they are true or not. Such sayings themselves grow harder and adhere more firmly with age and it would take many blows with a trowel to clean an old wiseacre of them. Many of the villages of Mesopotamia are built of second-hand bricks of a very good quality, obtained from the ruins of Babylon, and the cement on them is older and probably harder still. However that may be, I was struck by the peculiar toughness of the steel which bore so many violent blows without being worn out. As my bricks had been in a chimney before, though I did not read the name of Nebuchadnezzar on them, I picked out as many fireplace bricks as I could find, to save work and waste, and I filled the spaces between the bricks about the fireplace with stones from the pond shore, 
and also made my mortar with the white sand from the same place. I lingered most about the fireplace as the most vital part of the house. Indeed, I worked so deliberately that though I commenced at the ground in the morning, a course of bricks raised a few inches above the floor served for my pillow at night. Yet I did not get a stiff neck for it that I remember. My stiff neck is of older date. I took a poet to board for a fortnight about those times, which caused me to be put to it for room. He brought his own knife, though I had two, and we used to scour them by thrusting them into the earth. He shared with me the labors of cooking. I was pleased to see my work rising so square and solid by degrees, and reflected that, if it proceeded slowly, it was calculated to endure a long time. The chimney is to some extent an independent structure, standing on the ground and rising through the house to the heavens. Even after the house is burned, it still stands sometimes, and its importance and independence are apparent. This was toward the end of summer. It was now November. The north wind had already begun to cool the pond, though it took many weeks of steady blowing to accomplish it. It is so deep. When I began to have a fire at evening, before I plastered my house, the chimney carried smoke particularly well, because of the numerous chinks between the boards. Yet I passed some cheerful evenings in that cool and airy apartment, surrounded by the rough brown boards full of knots, and rafters with the bark on high overhead. My house never pleased my eye so much after it was plastered, though I was obliged to confess that it was more comfortable. Should not every apartment in which man dwells be lofty enough to create some obscurity overhead, where flickering shadows may play at evening about the rafters? These forms are more agreeable to the fancy and imagination than fresco paintings or other the most expensive furniture. I now first began to inhabit my house, I may say, when I began to use it for warmth as well as shelter. I had got a couple of old fire dogs to keep the wood from the hearth, and it did me good to see the soot form on the back of the chimney which I had built, and I poked the fire with more right and more satisfaction than usual. My dwelling was small, and I could hardly entertain an echo in it, but it seemed larger for being a single apartment and remote from neighbors. All the attractions of a house were concentrated in one room. It was kitchen, chamber, parlor, and keeping room, and whatever satisfaction parent or child, master or servant derive from living in a house, I enjoyed it all. Cato says, the master of a family, patrem familius, must have in his rustic villa Salem Olierium, Venerium, Dolia Multa, Uti Lubiat, Keretatum Expecter, E Re, E Vertuti, E Glorie Erit. That is, an oil and wine cellar, many casks, so that it may be pleasant to expect hard times, it will be for his advantage and virtue and glory. I had in my cellar a firkin of potatoes, about two quarts of peas with a weevil in them, and on my shelf a little rice, a jug of molasses, and of rye and Indian meal, a peck each. I sometimes dream of a larger and more populous house, standing in a golden age, of enduring materials and without gingerbread work, which shall still consist of only one room, a vast, rude, substantial, primitive hall, without ceiling or plastering, with bare rafters and purlins supporting a sort of lower heaven over one's head, 
useful to keep off rain and snow, where the king and queen posts stand out to receive your homage. When you have done reverence to the prostrate Saturn of an older dynasty on stepping over the sill, a cavernous house, wherein you must reach up a torch upon a pole to see the roof, where some may live in the fireplace, some in the recess of a window, and some on settles, some at one end of the hall, some at another, and some aloft on rafters, with the spiders if they choose. A house which you have got into when you have opened the outside door, and the ceremony is over, where the weary traveler may wash and eat and converse and sleep without further journey. Such a shelter as you would be glad to reach in a tempestuous night, containing all the essentials of a house, and nothing for housekeeping, where you can see all the treasures of the house at one view, and everything hangs upon its peg that a man should use, at once kitchen, pantry, parlor, chamber, store, house, and garret, where you can see so necessary a thing as a barrel or a ladder, so convenient a thing as a cupboard, and hear the pot boil, and pay your respects to the fire that cooks your dinner, and the oven that bakes your bread, and the necessary furniture and utensils are the chief ornaments, where the washing is not put out, nor the fire, nor the mistress, and perhaps you are sometimes requested to move from off the trap-door when the cook would descend into the cellar, and so learn whether the ground is solid or hollow beneath you without stamping. A house whose inside is as open and manifest as a bird's nest, and you cannot go in at the front door and out at the back without seeing some of its inhabitants. Where to be a guest is to be presented with the freedom of the house, and not to be carefully excluded from seven-eighths of it, shut up in a particular cell and told to make yourself at home there, in solitary confinement. Nowadays the host does not admit you to his hearth, but has got the mason to build one for yourself somewhere in his alley, and hospitality is the art of keeping you at the greatest distance. There is as much secrecy about the cooking as if he had a design to poison you. I am aware that I have been on many a man's premises, and might have been legally ordered off, but I am not aware that I have been in many men's houses. I might visit in my old clothes a king and queen who lived simply in such a house as I have described, if I were going their way, but backing out of a modern palace will be all that I shall desire to learn, if ever I am caught in one. It would seem as if the very language of our parlors would lose all its nerve and degenerate into palaver holy, our lives pass at such remoteness from its symbols and its metaphors and tropes are necessarily so far-fetched, through slides and dumb waiters, as it were. In other words, the parlor is so far from the kitchen and workshop. The dinner, even, is only the parable of a dinner, commonly, as if only the savage dwelt near enough to nature and truth to borrow a trope from them. How can the scholar, who dwells away in the northwest territory or the Isle of Man, tell what is parliamentary in the kitchen? However, only one or two of my guests were ever bold enough to stay and eat a hasty pudding with me, but when they saw that crisis approaching they beat a hasty retreat, rather, as if it would shake the house to its foundations. Nevertheless, it stood through a great many hasty puddings. I did not plaster till it was freezing weather. I brought over some whiter and cleaner sand for this purpose from the opposite shore of the pond in a boat, a sort of conveyance which would have tempted me to go much farther if necessary. 
My house had in the meanwhile been shingled down to the ground on every side. In lathing I was pleased to be able to send home each nail with a single blow of the hammer, and it was my ambition to transfer the plaster from the board to the wall neatly and rapidly. I remembered the story of a conceited fellow who, in fine clothes, was wont to lounge about the village once, giving advice to workmen. Venturing one day to substitute deeds for words, he turned up his cuffs, seized a plasterer's board, and having loaded his trowel without mishap, with a complacent look toward the lathing overhead, made a bold gesture thitherward, and straightway, to his complete discomfiture, received the whole contents in his ruffled bosom. I admired anew the economy and convenience of plastering, which so effectually shuts out the cold and takes a handsome finish, and I learned the various casualties to which the plasterer is liable. I was surprised to see how thirsty the bricks were which drank up all the moisture in my plaster before I had smoothed it, and how many pailfuls of water it takes to christen a new hearth. I had, the previous winter, made a small quantity of lime by burning the shells of the Unio Fluviatilis, which our river affords, for the sake of the experiment, so that I knew where my materials came from. I might have got good limestone within a mile or two and burned it myself if I had cared to do so. The pond had in the meanwhile skimmed over in the shadiest and shallowest coves, some days or even weeks before the general freezing. The first ice is especially interesting and perfect, being hard, dark, and transparent, and affords the best opportunity that ever offers for examining the bottom where it is shallow, for you can lie at your length on ice only an inch thick like a skater insect on the surface of the water, and study the bottom at your leisure only two or three inches distant, like a picture behind a glass and the water is necessarily always smooth then. There are many furrows in the sand where some creature has traveled about and doubled on its tracks, and, for wrecks, it is strewn with the cases of caddis-worms made of minute grains of white quartz. Perhaps these have creased it, for you find some of their cases in the furrows though they are deep and broad for them to make. But the ice itself is the object of most interest, though you must improve the earliest opportunity to study it. If you examine it closely, the morning after it freezes, you find that the greater part of the bubbles, which at first appeared to be within it, are against its under surface, and that more are continually rising from the bottom, while the ice is as yet comparatively solid and dark, that is, you see the water through it. These bubbles are from an eightieth to an eighth of an inch in diameter, very clear and beautiful, and you see your face reflected in them through the ice. There may be thirty or forty of them to a square inch. There are also already within the ice narrow, oblong, perpendicular bubbles about half an inch long, sharp cones with the apex upward, or oftener, if the ice is quite fresh, minute spherical bubbles, one directly above another like a string of beads. But these within the ice are not so numerous nor obvious as those beneath. I sometimes used to cast on stones to try the strength of the ice, and those which broke through carried in air with them, which formed very large and conspicuous white bubbles beneath. One day, when I came to the same place forty-eight hours afterward, I found that those large bubbles were still perfect, though an inch more of ice had formed, as I could see distinctly by the seam in the edge of a cake. But as the last two days had been very warm, like an Indian summer, the ice was now transparent, showing the dark green color of the water and the bottom, 
but opaque and whitish or gray, and though twice as thick, was hardly stronger than before. For the air bubbles had greatly expanded under this heat and run together and lost their regularity. They were no longer one directly over another, but often like silvery coins poured from a bag, one overlapping another, or in thin flakes as if occupying slight cleavages. The beauty of the ice was gone, and it was too late to study the bottom. Being curious to know what position my great bubbles occupied with regard to the new ice, I broke out a cake containing a middling-sized one and turned it bottom upward. The new ice had formed around and under the bubble, so that it was included between the two ices. It was wholly in the lower ice, but close against the upper, and was flattish or perhaps slightly lenticular, with a rounded edge a quarter of an inch deep by four inches in diameter, and I was surprised to find that directly under the bubble the ice was melted with a great regularity in the form of a saucer reversed, to the height of five-eighths of an inch in the middle, leaving a thin partition there between the water and the bubble, hardly an eighth of an inch thick, and in many places the small bubbles in this partition had burst out downward, and probably there was no ice at all under the largest bubbles, which were a foot in diameter. I inferred that the infinite number of minute bubbles which I had first seen against the under surface of the ice were now frozen in likewise, and that each, in its degree, had operated like a burning glass on the ice beneath to melt and rot it. These are the little air guns which contribute to make the ice crack and whoop. At length the winter set in good earnest, just as I had finished plastering, and the wind began to howl around the house, as if it had not had permission to do so till then. Night after night the geese came lumbering in the dark, with a clangor and a whistling of wings, even after the ground was covered with snow, some to alight in Walden, and some flying low over the woods toward Fair Haven bound for Mexico. Several times, when returning from the village at ten or eleven o'clock at night, I heard the tread of a flock of geese, or else ducks, on the dry leaves in the woods by a pond hole behind my dwelling, where they had come up to feed, and the faint honk or quack of their leader as they hurried off. In 1845 Walden froze entirely over for the first time on the night of the twenty-second of December. Flints and other shallower ponds, and the river having been frozen ten days or more. In forty-six, the sixteenth. In forty-nine, about the thirty-first. And in fifty, about the twenty-seventh of December. In fifty-two, the fifth of January. In fifty-three, the thirty-first of December. The snow had already covered the ground since the twenty-fifth of November, and surrounded me suddenly with the scenery of winter. I withdrew yet farther into my shell, and endeavored to keep a bright fire both within my house and within my breast. My employment out of doors now was to collect the dead wood in the forest, bringing it in my hands or on my shoulders, or sometimes trailing a dead pine tree under each arm to my shed an old forest fence which had seen its best days, was a great haul for me. I sacrificed it to Vulcan, for it was past serving the god Terminus. How much more interesting an event is that man's supper who has just been forth in the snow to hunt, nay, you might say, steal the fuel to cook it with, his bread and meat, are sweet. There are enough faggots and waste wood of all kinds in the forest of most of our towns to support many fires, but which at present warm none, 
and some think hinder the growth of the young wood. There was also the driftwood of the pond. In the course of the summer I had discovered a raft of pitch-pine logs with the bark on, pinned together by the Irish when the railroad was built. This I hauled up partly on the shore. After soaking two years, and then lying high six months, it was perfectly sound, though waterlogged past drying. I amused myself one winter day with sliding this piecemeal across the pond, nearly half a mile, skating behind with one end of a log fifteen feet long on my shoulder and the other on the ice. Or I tied several logs together with a birch withe, and then with a longer birch or alder which had a book at the end, dragged them across. Though completely waterlogged and almost as heavy as lead, they not only burned long, but made a very hot fire. Nay, I thought that they burned better for the soaking, as if the pitch, being confined by the water, burned longer, as in a lamp. Gilpin, in his account of the forest borderers of England, says that the encroachments of trespassers and the houses and fences thus raised on the borders of the forest were considered as great nuisances by the old forest law, and were severely punished under the name of pure prestures, as tending ad terrorem ferarum, ad nocumentum forestae, etc., to the frightening of the game and the detriment of the forest. But I was interested in the preservation of the venison and the vert more than the hunters or woodchoppers, and as much as though I had been the Lord Warden myself. And if any part was burned, though I burned it myself by accident, I grieved with a grief that lasted longer and was more inconsolable than that of the proprietors. Nay, I grieved when it was cut down by the proprietors themselves. My would that our farmers, when they cut down a forest, felt some of that awe which the old Romans did when they came to thin, or let in the light to, a consecrated grove. Lusum conlucer. That is, would believe that it is sacred to some god. The Roman made an expiatory offering, and prayed, Whatever god or goddess thou art to whom this grove is sacred, be propitious to me, my family and children, etc. It is remarkable what a value is still put upon wood, even in this age and in this new country, a value more permanent and universal than that of gold. After all our discoveries and inventions, no man will go by a pile of wood. It is as precious to us as it was to our Saxon and Norman ancestors. If they made their bows of it, we make our gun-stocks of it. Michaud, more than thirty years ago, says that the price of wood for fuel in New York and Philadelphia nearly equals, and sometimes exceeds, that of the best wood in Paris, though this immense capital annually requires more than three hundred thousand cords, and is surrounded to the distance of three hundred miles by cultivated plains. In this town the price of wood rises almost steadily, and the only question is how much higher it is to be this year than it was the last. Mechanics and tradesmen who come in person to the forest on no other errand are sure to attend the wood auction, and even pay a high price for the privilege of gleaning after the woodchopper. It is now many years that men have resorted to the forest for fuel and the material of the arts. The New Englander and the New Hollander, the Parisian and the Celt, the Farmer and Robin Hood, Goody Blake and Harry Gill. In most parts of the world the Prince and the Peasant, 
the scholar and the savage equally require still a few sticks from the forest to warm them and cook their food. Neither could I do without them. Every man looks at his woodpile with a kind of affection. I love to have mine before my window, and the more chips the better, to remind me of my pleasing work. I had an old axe which nobody claimed, with which by spells in winter days and on the sunny side of the house I played about the stumps which I had got out of my bean-field. As my driver prophesied when I was ploughing, they warmed me twice, once while I was splitting them, and again when they were on the fire, so that no fuel could give out more heat. As for the axe, I was advised to get the village blacksmith to jump it. But I jumped him, and putting a hickory helve from the woods into it, made it do. If it was dull, it was at least hung true. A few pieces of fat pine were a great treasure. It is interesting to remember how much of this food for fire is still concealed in the bowels of the earth. In previous years I had often gone prospecting over some bare hillside, where a pitch-pine wood had formerly stood, and got out the fat pine roots. They are almost indestructible. Stumps thirty or forty years old, at least, will still be sound at the core, though the sap wood has all become vegetable mold, as appears by the scales of the thick bark forming a ring level with the earth four or five inches distant from the heart. With axe and shovel you explore this mine, and follow the marrowy store, yellow as beef tallow, or as if you had struck on a vein of gold deep into the earth. But commonly I kindled my fire with the dry leaves of the forest, which I had stored up in my shed before the snow came. Green hickory finely split makes the woodchopper's kindlings, when he has a camp in the woods. Once in a while I got a little of this. When the villagers were lighting their fires beyond the horizon, I too gave notice to the various wild inhabitants of Walden Vale by a smoky streamer from my chimney that I was awake. Light-winged smoke, Icarian bird, melting thy pinions in thy upward flight, lark without a song, and messenger of dawn, circling above the hamlets as thy nest or else departing dream and shadowy form of midnight vision gathering up thy skirts, by night star-veiling and by day darkening the light and blotting out the sun. Go thou, my incense, upward from this hearth, and ask the gods to pardon this clear flame. Hard green wood just cut, though I used but little of that, answered my purpose better than any other. I sometimes left a good fire when I went to take a walk in a winter afternoon, and when I returned three or four hours afterward, it would be still alive and glowing. My house was not empty, though I was gone. It was as if I had left a cheerful housekeeper behind. It was I and fire that lived there and commonly my housekeeper proved trustworthy. One day, however, as I was splitting wood, I thought that I would just look in at the window and see if the house was not on fire. It was the only time I remember to having been particularly anxious on this score. So I looked, and saw that a spark had caught my bed, and I went in and extinguished it when it had burned a place as big as my hand, but my house occupied so sunny and sheltered a position, and its roof was so low that I could afford to let the fire go out in the middle of almost any winter day. The moles nested in my cellar, nibbling every third potato, and making a snug bed even there of some hair left after plastering and of brown paper, for even the wildest animals love comfort and warmth as well as man. 
and they survive the winter only because they are so careful to secure them. Some of my friends spoke as if I was coming to the woods on purpose to freeze myself. The animal merely makes a bed, which he warms with his body, in a sheltered place. But man, having discovered fire, boxes up some air in a spacious apartment, and warms that, instead of robbing himself, makes that his bed, in which he can move without divesting of more cumbrous clothing, maintain a kind of summer in the midst of winter, and by means of windows even admit the light, and with a lamp lengthen out the day. Thus he goes a step or two beyond instinct, and saves a little time for the fine arts. Though when I had been exposed to the rudest blasts a long time, my whole body began to grow torpid. When I reached the genial atmosphere of my house, I soon recovered my faculties and prolonged my life. But the most luxuriously housed has little to boast of in this respect, nor need we trouble ourselves to speculate how the human race may be at last destroyed. It would be easy to cut their threads at any time with a little sharper blast from the north. We go on dating from cold Fridays and great snows, but a little colder Friday or greater snow would put a period to man's existence on the globe. The next winter I used a small cooking stove for economy since I did not own the forest, but it did not keep fire so well as the open fireplace. Cooking was then, for the most part, no longer a poetic, but merely a chemic process. It will soon be forgotten in these days of stoves that we used to roast potatoes in the ashes after the Indian fashion. The stove not only took up room and scented the house, but it concealed the fire, and I felt as if I had lost a companion. You can always see a face in the fire. The laborer looking into it at evening purifies his thoughts of the dross and earthiness which they have accumulated during the day. But I could no longer sit and look into the fire, and the pertinent words of a poet recurred to me with new force. Never bright flame may be denied to me thy dear life-imaging close sympathy. What but my hopes shot upward ere so bright? What but my fortunes sunk so low in night? Why art thou banished from our hearth and hall, thou who art welcomed and beloved by all? Was thy existence then too fanciful, for our life's common light, who are so dull? Did thy bright gleam, mysterious converse, hold with our congenial souls, secrets too bold? Well, we are safe and strong, for now we sit beside a hearth where no dim shadows flit where nothing cheers nor saddens but a fire, warms feet in hands, nor does to more aspire. By whose compact utilitarian heap the present may sit down and go to sleep, nor fear the ghosts who from the dim past walked and with us by the unequal light of the old wood fire talked. End of chapter 13 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 14 Former Inhabitants and Winter Visitors I weathered some merry snowstorms and spent some cheerful winter evenings by my fireside, while the snow whirled wildly without, and even the hooting of the owl was hushed. 
For many weeks I met no one in my walks but those who came occasionally to cut wood and sled it to the village. The elements, however, abetted me in making a path through the deepest snow in the woods, for when I had once gone through the wind blew the oak leaves into my tracks, where they lodged, and by absorbing the rays of the sun melted the snow, and so not only made a bed for my feet, but in the night their dark line was my guide. For human society I was obliged to conjure up the former occupants of these woods. Within the memory of many of my townsmen, the road near which my house stands resounded with the laugh and gossip of inhabitants, and the woods which border it were notched and dotted here and there with their little gardens and dwellings, though it was then much more shut in by the forest than now. In some places within my own remembrance the pines would scrape both sides of a chaise at once, and women and children who were compelled to go this way to Lincoln alone and on foot did it with fear, and often ran a good deal of the distance. Though mainly but a humble route to neighboring villages, or for the woodsman's team, it once amused the traveler more than now by its variety and lingered longer in his memory. Where now firm open fields stretch from the village to the woods, it then ran through a maple swamp on a foundation of logs, the remnants of which doubtless still underlie the present dusty highway, from the Stratton, now the Alms House Farm, to Brister's Hill. East of my bean field, across the road, lived Cato Ingraham, slave of Duncan Ingraham, Esquire, gentleman of Concord Village, who built his slave a house, and gave him permission to live in Walden Woods. Cato, but not Eutysensis, but Concordiensis. Some say that he was a Guinea Negro. There are a few who remember his little patch among the walnuts, which he let grow up till he should be old and need them. But a younger and whiter speculator got them at last. He too, however, occupies an equally narrow house at present. Cato's half-obliterated cellar hole still remains, though known to few, being concealed from the traveller by a fringe of pines. It is now filled with the smooth sumac, rus glabra, and one of the earliest species of goldenrod, Solidago stricta, grows there luxuriantly. Here, by the very corner of my field still nearer to town, Zilpha, a colored woman, had her little house, where she spun linen for the townsfolk, making the Walden woods ring with her shrill singing, for she had a loud and notable voice. At length, in the War of 1812, her dwelling was set on fire by English soldiers, prisoners on parole, when she was away, and her cat and dog and hens were all burned up together. She led a hard life, and somewhat inhumane. One old frequenter of these woods remembers that, as he passed her house one noon, he heard her muttering to herself over her gurgling pot, Ye are all bones, bones. I have seen bricks amid the oak copse there. Down the road on the right hand, on Brister's Hill, lived Brister Freeman, a handy negro, slave of Squire Cummings once. There where grow still the apple trees which Brister planted and tended large old trees now, but their fruit still wild and ciderish to my taste. Not long since I read his epitaph in the old Lincoln burying ground, a little on one side, near the unmarked graves of some British grenadiers who fell in the retreat from Concord, where he is styled Scipio Brister. Scipio Africanus 
he had some title to be called, a man of color, as if he were discolored. It also told me, with staring emphasis, when he died, which was but an indirect way of informing me that he ever lived. With him dwelt Fenda, his hospitable wife, who told fortunes, yet pleasantly, large, round, and black, blacker than any of the children of night. Such a dusky orb as never rose on Concord before or since. Farther down the hill on the left, on the old road in the woods, are marks of some homestead of the Stratton family, whose orchard once covered all the slope of Brister's Hill, but was long since killed out by pitch-pines, excepting a few stumps, whose old roots furnish still the wild stalks of many a thrifty village tree. Nearer yet to town you come to Breed's location, on the other side of the way, just on the edge of the wood, ground famous for the pranks of a demon not distinctly named in old mythology, who has acted a prominent and astounding part in our New England life, and deserves as much as any mythological character to have his biography written one day, who first comes in the guise of a friend or hired man, and then robs and murders the whole family. New England rum. But history must not yet tell the tragedies enacted here. Let time intervene in some measure to assuage and lend an azure tint to them. Here the most indistinct and dubious tradition says that once a tavern stood, the well the same, which tempered the traveller's beverage and refreshed his steed. Here, then, men saluted one another, and heard and told the news, and went their ways again. Breed's hut was standing only a dozen years ago, though it had long been unoccupied. It was about the size of mine. It was set on fire by mischievous boys one election night, if I do not mistake. I lived on the edge of the village then, and had just lost myself over Davenant's Gondebert, that winter that I labored with a lethargy, which, by the way, I never knew whether to regard as a family complaint, having an uncle who goes to sleep shaving himself, and is obliged to sprout potatoes in a cellar Sundays in order to keep awake and keep the Sabbath or as the consequence of my attempt to read Chalmers' collection of English poetry without skipping. It fairly overcame my nervi. I had just sunk my head on this when the bells rung fire, and in hot haste the engines rolled that way, led by a straggling troop of men and boys, and I among the foremost, for I had leaped the brook. We thought it was far south over the woods, we who had run to fires before, barn, shop, or dwelling-house, or all together. "'It's Baker's Barn!' cried one. "'It is the Codman Place!' affirmed another. And then fresh sparks went up above the wood, as if the roof fell in, and we all shouted, "'Concord to the rescue!' Wagons shot past with furious speed and crushing loads, bearing, perchance, among the rest, the agent of the insurance company, who was bound to go, however far, and ever and anon the engine bell tinkled behind, more slow and sure and rearmost of all, as it was afterward whispered, came they who set the fire and gave the alarm. Thus we kept on like true idealists, rejecting the evidence of our senses, until at a turn in the road we heard the crackling, and actually felt the heat of the fire from over the wall, and realized, alas, that we were there. The very nearness of the fire but cooled our ardor. At first we thought to throw a frog-pond on to it, but concluded to let it burn, and was so far gone and so worthless. So we stood round our engine, jostled one another, 
expressed our sentiments through speaking trumpets or in lower tone referred to the great conflagrations which the world has witnessed including bascom's shop and between ourselves we thought that were we there in season with our tub and a full frog pond by we could turn that threatened last and universal one into another flood we finally retreated without doing any mischief returned to sleep and gondibert but as for gondibert i would accept that passage in the preface about wit being the soul's powder but most of mankind are strangers to wit as indians are to powder it chanced that i walked that way across the fields the following night about the same hour and hearing a low moaning at this spot I drew near in the dark and discovered the only survivor of the family that I know, the heir of both its virtues and its vices, who alone was interested in this burning, lying on his stomach and looking over the cellar wall at the still smouldering cinders beneath, muttering to himself as is his wont. He had been working far off in the river meadows all day and had improved the first moments that he could call his own to visit the home of his fathers and his youth. He gazed into the cellar from all sides and points of view by turns, always lying down to it, as if there was some treasure which he remembered concealed between the stones, where there was absolutely nothing but a heap of bricks and ashes. The house being gone, he looked at what there was left, he was soothed by the sympathy which my mere presence implied, and showed me, as well as the darkness permitted, where the well was covered up, which, thank heaven, could never be burned, and he groped long about the wall to find the well sweep which his father had cut and mounted, feeling for the iron hook or staple by which a burden had been fastened to the heavy end, all that he could now cling to to convince me that it was no common rider. I felt it, and still remark it almost daily in my walks, for by it hangs the history of a family. Once more on the left, where are seen the well and lilac bushes by the wall, in the now open field, lived Nutting and Le Gros, but to return toward Lincoln. Farther in the woods than any of these, where the road approaches nearest to the pond, Wyman the potter squatted, and furnished his townsmen with earthenware, and left descendants to succeed him. Neither were they rich in worldly goods, holding the land by sufferance while they lived, and there often the sheriff came in vain to collect the taxes, and attached a chip for form's sake, as I have read in his accounts, there being nothing else that he could lay his hands on. One day in midsummer, when I was hoeing, a man who was carrying a load of pottery to market stopped his horse against my field and inquired concerning Wyman the Younger. He had long ago bought a potter's wheel of him and wished to know what had become of him. I had read of the potter's clay and wheel in scripture, but it had never occurred to me that the pots we use were not such as had come down unbroken from those days, or grown on trees like gourds somewhere, and I was pleased to hear that so fictile an art was ever practiced in my neighborhood. The last inhabitant of these woods before me was an Irishman, Hugh Coyle, if I have spelt his name with coil enough, who occupied Wyman's tenement. Colonel Coil, he was called. Rumor said that he had been a soldier at Waterloo. If he had lived, I should have made him fight his battles over again. His trade here was that of a ditcher. Napoleon went to St. Helena. Coil came to Walden Woods. All I know of him is tragic. He was a man of manners, like one who had seen the world and was capable of more civil speech than you could well attend to. 
He wore a great coat in midsummer, being affected with the trembling delirium, and his face was the color of carmine. He died in the road, at the foot of Brister's Hill, shortly after I came to the woods, so that I have not remembered him as a neighbor. Before his house was pulled down, when his comrades avoided it as an unlucky castle, I visited it. There lay his old clothes, curled up by use, as if they were himself, upon his raised plank bed. His pipe lay broken on the hearth, instead of a bowl broken at the fountain. The last could never have been the symbol of his death, for he confessed to me that, though he had heard of Brister's Spring, he had never seen it. And soiled cards, kings of diamonds, spades, and hearts, were scattered over the floor. One black chicken, which the administrator could not catch, black as night and as silent, not even croaking, awaited Reynard, still went to roost in the next apartment. In the rear there was the dim outline of a garden, which had been planted but had never received its first hoeing, owing to those terrible shaking fits, though it was now harvest time. It was overrun with Roman wormwood and beggar ticks, which last stuck to my clothes for all fruit. The skin of a woodchuck was freshly stretched upon the back of the house, a trophy of his last Waterloo. But no warm cap or mittens would he want more. Now only a dent in the earth marks the site of these dwellings, with buried cellar stones and strawberries, raspberries, thimbleberries, hazel bushes, and sumacs growing in the sunny sward there. Some pitch-pine or gnarled oak occupies what was the chimney-nook, and a sweet-scented black birch, perhaps, waves where the door-stone was. Sometimes the well-dent is visible, where once a spring oozed, now dry and tearless grass. Or it was covered deep, not to be discovered till some late day with a flat stone under the sod, when the last of the race departed. What a sorrowful act must that be, the covering up of wells, coincident with the opening of wells of tears. These cellar dents, like deserted fox burrows, old holes, are all that is left where once were the stir and bustle of human life, and fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, in some form and dialect or other, were by turns discussed. But all I can learn of their conclusions amount to just this, that Cato and Brister pulled wool, which is about as edifying as the history of more famous schools of philosophy, still grows the vivacious lilac. A generation after the door and lintel and the sill are gone, unfolding its sweet-scented flowers each spring to be plucked by the musing traveler, planted and tended once by children's hands in front-yard plots, now standing by wall-sides in retired pastures, and giving place to new rising forests. The last of that stirp, sole survivor of that family. Little did the dusky children think that the puny slip with its two eyes only, which they stuck in the ground in the shadow of the house and daily watered, would root itself so, and outlive them, and house itself in the rear that shaded it, and grown man's garden and orchard, and tell their story, faintly, to the lone wanderer 
a half century after they had grown up and died, blossoming as fair and smelling as sweet as in that first spring. I mark its still tender, civil, cheerful lilac colors. But this small village, germ of something more, why did it fail while Concord keeps its ground? Were there no natural advantages, no water privileges, forsooth? Why, the deep Walden Pond and cool Brister Spring, privileged to drink long and healthy draughts at these, all unimproved by these men but to dilute their glass. They were universally a thirsty race. Might not the basket, stable broom, mat-making, corn parching, linen spinning, and pottery business have thrived here, making the wilderness to blossom like the rose, and a numerous posterity have inherited the land of their fathers? The sterile soil would at least have been proof against a low land degeneracy. Alas, how little does the memory of these human inhabitants enhance the beauty of the landscape. Again, perhaps, nature will try, with me for a first settler, and my house raised last spring to be the oldest in the hamlet. I am not aware that any man has ever built on the spot which I occupy. Deliver me from a city built on the site of a more ancient city, whose materials are ruins, whose gardens, cemeteries. The soil is blanched and accursed there, and before that becomes necessary the earth itself will be destroyed. With some reminiscences, I repeopled the woods, and lulled myself to sleep. At this season I seldom had a visitor. When the snow lay deepest, no wanderer ventured near my house for a week or fortnight at a time. But there I lived, as snug as a meadow mouse, or as cattle and poultry which are said to have survived for a long time buried in drifts, even without food, or like that early settler's family in the town of Sutton, in this state, whose cottage was completely covered by the great snow of 1717, when he was absent, and an Indian found it only by the hole which the chimney's breath made in the drift, and so relieved the family. But no friendly Indian concerned himself about me, nor needed he, for the master of the house was at home. The great snow! How cheerful it is to hear of! When the farmers could not get to the woods and swamps with their teams, and were obliged to cut down the shade trees before their houses, and when the crust was harder, cut off the trees in the swamps, ten feet from the ground, as it appeared the next spring. In the deepest snows, the path which I used from the highway to my house, about half a mile long, might have been represented by a meandering dotted line, with wide intervals between the dots. For a week of even weather I took exactly the same number of steps, and of the same length, coming and going, stepping deliberately and with the precision of a pair of dividers in my own deep tracks. To such routine the winter reduces us, yet often they were filled with heaven's own blue. But no weather interfered fatally with my walks, or rather my going abroad for I frequently tramped eight or ten miles through the deepest snow to keep an appointment with a beech tree, or a yellow birch, or an old acquaintance among the pines. 
when the ice and snow causing their limbs to droop, and so sharpening their tops, had changed the pines into fir trees. Wading to the tops of the highest hills, when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level, and shaking down another snowstorm on my head at every step, or sometimes creeping and floundering thither on my hands and knees when the hunters had gone into winter quarters. One afternoon I amused myself by watching a barred owl, Strix nebulosa, sitting on one of the lower dead limbs of a white pine, close to the trunk, in broad daylight, I standing within a rod of him. He could hear me when I moved, and crunched the snow with my feet, but could not plainly see me. When I made most noise he would stretch out his neck and erect his neck feathers, and open his eyes wide. But their lids soon fell again, and he began to nod. I, too, felt a slumberous influence after watching him half an hour, as he sat thus with his eyes, half open, like a cat, winged brother of the cat. There was only a narrow slit left between their lids, by which be preserved a peninsular relation to me. Thus, with half-shut eyes, looking out from the land of dreams, and endeavouring to realise me, vague object or moat that interrupts his visions. At length, on some louder noise or my nearer approach, he would grow uneasy and sluggishly turn about on his perch as if impatient at having his dreams disturbed. And when he launched himself off, and flapped through the pines, spreading his wings to unexpected breadth, I could not hear the slightest sound from them. Thus, guided amid the pine boughs, rather by a delicate sense of their neighborhood than by sight, feeling his twilight way, as it were, with his sensitive pinions, he found a new perch where he might in peace await the dawning of his day. As I walked over the long causeway made for the railroad through the meadows, I encountered many a blustering and nipping wind, for nowhere has it freer play, and when the frost had smitten me on one cheek, heathen as I was, I turned it to the other also nor was it much better by the carriage road from Brister's Hill, for I came to town still like a friendly Indian when the contents of the broad open fields were all piled up between the walls of the Walden Road, and half an hour sufficed to obliterate the tracks of the last traveller. And when I returned new drifts would have formed, through which I floundered, where the busy northwest wind had been depositing the powdery snow round a sharp angle in the road, and not a rabbit's track, nor even the fine print, the small type of a meadow mouse was to be seen. Yet I rarely failed to find, even in midwinter, some warm and springly swamp where the grass and the skunk cabbage still put forth their perennial verdure, and some hardier bird occasionally awaited the return of spring. Sometimes, notwithstanding the snow, when I returned from my walk at evening, I crossed the deep tracks of a wood-chopper leading from my door, and found his pile of whittlings on the hearth, and my house filled with the odor of his pipe. Or on a Sunday afternoon, if I chanced to be at home, I heard the crunching of the snow made by the step of a long-headed farmer, whom from far through the woods sought my house to have a social crack. One of the few of his vocation who are men of their farms, who donned a frock instead of a professor's gown, 
and is as ready to extract the moral out of church or state as to haul a load of manure from his barnyard. We talked of rude and simple times, when men sat about large fires in cold, bracing weather with clear heads, and when other dessert failed, we tried our teeth on many a nut which wise squirrels have long since abandoned, for those which have the thickest shells are commonly empty. The one who came from farthest to my lodge, through deepest snows and most dismal tempests, was a poet, a farmer, a hunter, a soldier, a reporter, even a philosopher may be daunted but nothing can deter a poet, for he is actuated by pure love. Who can predict his comings and goings? His business calls him out at all hours, even when doctors sleep. We made that small house ring with boisterous mirth and resound with the murmur of much sober talk making amends then to Walden Vale for the long silences. Broadway was still and deserted in comparison. At suitable intervals there were regular salutes of laughter, which might have been referred indifferently to the last uttered or the forthcoming jest. We made many a brand new theory of life over a thin dish of gruel, which combined the advantages of conviviality with the clear-headedness which philosophy requires. I should not forget that during my last winter at the pond there was another welcome visitor, who at one time came through the village, through snow and rain and darkness, till he saw my lamp through the trees, and shared with me some long winter evenings one of the last of the philosophers. Connecticut gave him to the world. He peddled first her wares, afterwards, as he declares, his brains. These he peddles still, prompting God and disgracing man, bearing for fruit his brain only, like the nut its kernel. I think that he must be the man of the most faith of any alive, his words and attitude always suppose a better state of things than other men are acquainted with, and he will be the last man to be disappointed as the ages revolve. He has no venture in the present, but though comparatively disregarded now, when his day comes laws unsuspected by most will take effect, and masters of families and rulers will come to him for advice. How blind that cannot see serenity! A true friend of man, almost the only friend of human progress, an old mortality, say rather an immortality, with unwearied patience and faith making plain the image engraven in men's bodies, the god of whom they are but defaced and leaning monuments. With his hospitable intellect he embraces children, beggars, insane, and scholars, and entertains the thought of all, adding to it commonly some breadth and elegance. I think that he should keep a caravansary on the world's highway, where philosophers of all nations might put up, and on his sign should be printed, Entertainment for man, but not for his beast. Enter ye that have leisure and a quiet mind, who earnestly seek the right road. He is perhaps the sanest man, and has the fewest crotchets of any I chance to know, the same yesterday and to-morrow. Of yore we had sauntered and talked, and effectually put the world behind us, 
for he was pledged to no institution in it, free-born, ingenus. Whichever way we turned, it seemed that the heavens and the earth had met together, since he enhanced the beauty of the landscape. A blue-robed man, whose fittest roof is the overarching sky which reflects his serenity. I do not see how he can ever die. Nature cannot spare him. Having each some shingles of thought well dried, we sat and whittled them, trying our knives and admiring the clear yellowish grain of the pumpkin pine. We waited so gently and reverently, or we pulled together so smoothly that the fishes of thought were not scared from the stream, nor feared any angler on the bank, but came and went grandly, like the clouds which float through the western sky and the mother-o'-pearl flocks which sometimes form and dissolve there. There we worked, revising mythology, rounding a fable here and there, and building castles in the air, for which earth offered no worthy foundation. Great looker, great expector, to converse with whom was a New England night's entertainment. Ah, such discourse we had, hermit and philosopher, and the old settler I have spoken of, we three, it expanded and racked my little house. I should not dare to say how many pounds weight there was above the atmospheric pressure on every circular inch. It opened its seams so that they had to be caulked with much dullness thereafter to stop the consequent leak. But I had enough of that kind of oakum already picked. There was one other with whom I had solid seasons, long to be remembered, at his house in the village, and who looked in upon me from time to time. But I had no more for society there. There, too, as everywhere, I sometimes expected the visitor who never comes. The Vishnu Purana says, The householder is to remain at eventide in his courtyard as long as it takes to milk a cow, or longer, if he pleases, to await the arrival of a guest. I often performed this duty of hospitality, waited long enough to milk a whole herd of cows, but did not see the man approaching from the town. End of chapter 14 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 15 Winter Animals When the ponds were firmly frozen, they afforded not only new and shorter routes to many points, but new views from their surfaces of the familiar landscape around them. When I crossed Flint's Pond after it was covered with snow, though I had often paddled about and skated over it, it was so unexpectedly wide and so strange that I could think of nothing but Baffin's Bay. The Lincoln Hills rose up around me at the extremity of a snowy plain, in which I did not remember to have stood before and the fishermen, at an indeterminable distance over the ice, moving slowly about with their wolfish dogs, passed for sealers or Eskimo, or in misty weather loomed like fabulous creatures, and I did not know whether they were giants or pygmies. I took this course when I went to lecture in Lincoln in the evening, traveling in no road and passing no house between my own hut and the lecture-room. In Goose Pond, which lay in my way, a colony of muskrats dwelt, 
and raised their cabins high above the ice, though none could be seen abroad when I crossed it. Walden, being like the rest usually bare of snow, or with only shallow and interrupted drifts on it, was my yard where I could walk freely when the snow was nearly two feet deep on a level elsewhere, and the villagers were confined to their streets. There, far from the village street, and except at very long intervals, from the jingle of sleigh-bells, I slid and skated, as in a vast moose-yard well-trodden, overhung by oak woods and solemn pines bent down with snow or bristling with icicles. For sounds in winter nights, and often in winter days, I heard the forlorn but melodious note of a hooting owl indefinitely far, such a sound as the frozen earth would yield if struck with a suitable plectrum, the very lingua vernacula of Walden Wood, and quite familiar to me at last, though I never saw the bird while it was making it. I seldom opened my door in a winter evening without hearing it. Hoo, 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 hooter, hoo sounded sonorously, and the first three syllables accented uh, somewhat like how dare do, or sometimes who, who only. One night, in the beginning of winter, before the pond froze over, about nine o'clock, I was startled by the loud honking of a goose, and stepped to the door, heard the sound of their wings like a tempest in the woods as they flew low over my house. They passed over the pond toward Fairhaven, seemingly deterred from settling by my light, their commodore honking all the while with a regular beat. Suddenly an unmistakable cat-owl from very near me, with the most harsh and tremendous voice I ever heard from any inhabitant of the woods responded at regular intervals to the goose, as if determined to expose and disgrace this intruder from Hudson's Bay by exhibiting a greater compass and volume of voice in a native, and boo-hoo him out of Concord Horizon. What do you mean by alarming the citadel at this time of night consecrated to me? Do you think I am ever caught napping at such an hour, and that I have not got lungs and a larynx as well as yourself. Boo-hoo! 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 It was one of the most thrilling discords I ever heard. And yet, if you had a discriminating ear, there were in it the elements of a concord such as these plains never saw nor heard. I also heard the whooping of the ice in the pond, my great bedfellow in that part of Concord, as if it were restless in its bed and would fain turn over, were troubled with flatulency and had dreams, or I was waked by the cracking of the ground by the frost, as if someone had driven a team against my door, and in the morning would find a crack in the earth a quarter of a mile long and a third of an inch wide. Sometimes I heard the foxes as they ranged over the snow crust in moonlight nights, in search of a partridge or other game, barking raggedly and demoniacally like forest dogs, as if laboring with some anxiety or seeking expression, struggling for light and to be dogs outright and run freely in the streets. For if we take the ages into our account— May there not be a civilization going on among brutes as well as men? They seem to me to be rudimental, burrowing men, still standing on their defense, awaiting their transformation. Sometimes one came near to my window, attracted by my light, barked a vulpine curse at me, and then retreated. Usually the red squirrel, Sirius Hudsonius waked me in the dawn, coursing over the roof and up and down the sides of the house, as if sent out of the woods for this purpose. 
In the course of the winter I threw out half a bushel of ears of sweet corn which had not got ripe, on to the snow-crust by my door, and was amused by watching the motions of the various animals which were baited by it. In the twilight and the night the rabbits came regularly, and made a hearty meal. All day long the red squirrels came and went, and afforded me much entertainment by their maneuvers. One would approach at first warily, through the shrub oaks, running over the snow-crust by fits and starts like a leaf blown by the wind, now a few paces this way, with wonderful speed and waste of energy, making inconceivable haste with his trotters, as if it were for a wager. And now as many paces that way, but never getting on more than half a rod at a time, and then suddenly pausing with a ludicrous expression and a gratuitous somerset, as if all the eyes in the universe were eyed on him. For all the motions of a squirrel, even in the most solitary recesses of the forest, imply spectators as much as those of a dancing girl, wasting more time in delay and circumspection than would have sufficed to walk the whole distance. I never saw one walk, and then suddenly, before you could say Jack Robinson, he would be in the top of a young pitch-pine winding up his clock and chiding all imaginary spectators, soliloquizing and talking to all the universe at the same time, for no reason that I could ever detect, or he himself was aware of, I suspect. At length he would reach the corn, and selecting a suitable ear, frisk about in the same uncertain trigonometrical way to the topmost stick of my woodpile before my window, where he looked me in the face, and there sit for hours, supplying himself with a new ear from time to time, nibbling at first voraciously, and throwing the half-naked cobs about, till at length he grew more dainty still, and played with his food, tasting only the inside of the kernel, and the ear, which was held balanced over the stick by one paw, slipping from his careless grasp, and fell to the ground, when he would look over at it with a ludicrous expression of uncertainty, as if suspecting that it had life, with a mind not made up whether to get it again, or a new one, or be off. Now thinking of corn, then listening to hear what was in the wind. So the little impudent fellow would waste many an ear in a forenoon, till at last, seizing some longer and plumper one, considerably bigger than himself, and skilfully balancing it, he would set out with it to the woods, like a tiger with a buffalo, by the same zigzag course and frequent pauses, scratching along with it as if it were too heavy for him, and falling all the while, making its fall a diagonal between a perpendicular and horizontal, being determined to put it through at any rate. A singularly frivolous and whimsical fellow, and so he would get off with it to where he lived, perhaps carry it to the top of a pine tree forty or fifty rods distant, and I would afterwards find the cobs strewn about the woods in various directions. At length the jays arrive, whose discordant screams were heard long before, as they were warily making their approach an eighth of a mile off, and in a stealthy and sneaking manner they flit from tree to tree, nearer and nearer, and pick up the kernels which the squirrels have dropped. Then, sitting on a pitch-pine bough, they attempt to swallow in their haste a kernel which is too big for their throats and chokes them, and after great labor they disgorge it, and spend an hour in the endeavor to crack it by repeated blows with their bills. They were manifestly thieves, and I had not much respect for them. But the squirrels, though at first shy, went to work as if they were taking what was their own. Meanwhile also came the chickadees in flocks, which, picking up the crumbs the squirrels had dropped, flew to the nearest twig, and placing them under their claws, hammered away at them with their little bills, 
as if it were an insect in the bark, till they were sufficiently reduced for their slender throats. A little flock of these titmice came daily to pick a dinner out of my woodpile, or the crumbs at my door, with faint flitting lisping notes, like the tinkling of icicles in the grass or else with sprightly day, 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 or more rarely in spring-like days, a wiry, summery Phoebe from the woodside. They were so familiar that at length one alighted on an armful of wood which I was carrying in and pecked at the sticks without fear. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment while I was hoeing in a village garden and I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulet I could have worn. The squirrels also grew at last to be quite familiar, and occasionally stepped upon my shoe, when that was the nearest way. When the ground was not yet quite covered, and again near the end of winter, when the snow was melted on my south hillside and about my woodpile, the partridges came out of the woods, morning and evening, to feed there. Whichever side you walk in the woods, the partridge bursts away on whirring wings, jarring the snow from the dry leaves and twigs on high, which comes sifting down in the sunbeams like golden dust. For this brave bird is not to be scared by winter. It is frequently covered up by drifts, and, it is said, sometimes plunges from on wing into the soft snow where it remains concealed for a day or two. I used to start them in the open land also, where they had come out of the woods at sunset to bud the wild apple trees. They will come regularly every evening to particular trees, where the cunning sportsman lies in wait for them, and the distant orchards next to the woods suffer thus not a little. I am glad that the partridge gets fed, at any rate. It is nature's own bird which lives on buds and diet drink. In dark winter mornings, or in short winter afternoons, I sometimes heard a pack of hounds threading all the woods with hounding cry and yelp, unable to resist the instinct of the chase, and the note of the hunting-horn at intervals, proving that man was in the rear. The woods ring again, and yet no fox bursts forth on to the open level of the pond, nor following pack pursuing their acteon. And perhaps at evening I see the hunters returning with a single brush trailing from their sleigh for a trophy, seeking therein. They tell me that if the fox would remain in the bosom of the frozen earth he would be safe, or if B would run in a straight line away no foxhound could overtake him, but having left his pursuers far behind he stops to rest and listen till they come up, and when he runs he circles round to his old haunts where the hunters await him. Sometimes, however, he will run upon a wall many rods, and then leap off far to one side, and he appears to know that water will not retain his scent. A hunter told me that he once saw a fox pursued by hounds burst out onto Walden when the ice was covered with shallow puddles, run part way across, and then return to the same shore. Ere long the hounds arrived, but here they lost the scent. Sometimes a pack, hunting by themselves, would pass my door, and circle round my house and yelp and hound without regarding me, as if afflicted by a species of madness, so that nothing could divert them from the pursuit. Thus they circle until they fall upon the recent trail of a fox, for a wise hound will forsake everything else for this. One day a man came to my hut from Lexington to inquire after his hound, that made a large track, and had been hunting for a week by himself. But I fear that he was not the wiser for all I told him, 
for every time I attempted to answer his questions he interrupted me by asking, "'What do you do here?' He had lost a dog, but found a man. One old hunter, who has a dry tongue, who used to come to bathe in Walden once every year when the water was warmest, and at such times looked in upon me, told me that many years ago he took his gun one afternoon and went out for a cruise in Walden Wood, and as he walked the Wayland Road he heard the cry of hounds approaching, and ere long a fox leaped the wall into the road, and as quick as thought leaped the other wall out of the road, and his swift bullet had not touched him. Some way behind came an old hound and her three pups in full pursuit, hunting on their own accord, and disappeared again in the woods. Late in the afternoon, as he was resting in the thick woods south of Walden, he heard the voice of the hounds far over toward Fair Haven, still pursuing the fox. And on they came, their hounding cry which made all the woods ring, sounding nearer and nearer, now from Well Meadow, now from the Baker Farm. For a long time he stood still and listened to their music, so sweet to a hunter's ear, when suddenly the fox appeared, threading the solemn aisles with an easy coursing pace, whose sound was concealed by a sympathetic rustle of the leaves, swift and still, keeping the round, leaving his pursuers far behind, and leaping upon a rock amid the woods he sat erect and listening, with his back to the hunter. For a moment compassion restrained the latter's arm, but that was a short-lived mood, and as quick as thought can follow thought his piece was leveled and whang! The fox, rolling over the rock, lay dead on the ground. The hunter still kept his place and listened to the hounds. Still on they came, and now the near woods resounded through all their aisles with their demoniac cry. At length the old hound burst into view with muzzle to the ground, and snapping the air as if possessed, and ran directly to the rock. But spying the dead fox, she suddenly ceased her hounding, as if struck dumb with amazement, and walked round and round him in silence. And one by one her pups arrived, and like their mother, were sobered into silence by the mystery. Then the hunter came forward and stood in their midst, and the mystery was solved. They waited in silence while he skinned the fox, then followed the brush a while, and at length turned off into the woods again. That evening a Weston squire came to the Concord hunter's cottage to inquire for his hounds, and told how for a week they had been hunting on their own account from Weston Woods. The Concord hunter told him what he knew and offered him the skin, but the other declined it and departed. He did not find his hounds that night, but the next day learned that they had crossed the river and put up at a farmhouse for the night, whence, having been well fed, they took their departure early in the morning. The hunter who told me this could remember one Sam Nutting, who used to hunt bears on Fairhaven ledges and exchange their skins for rum in Concord Village, who told him even that he had seen a moose there. Nutting had a famous foxhound named Burgoyne. He pronounced it Bogeen, which my informant used to borrow. In the vast book of an old trader of this town, who was also a captain, town clerk, and representative, I find the following entry. January 18, 1742-43. John Melvin, credited by one, Gray Fox, zero, two, three. They are not now found here, and in his ledger, February 7, 1743, Hezekiah Stratton has credit by one half a cat skin, zero, one, four plus. Of course, a wild cat, 
for Stratton was a sergeant in the old French war, and would not have got credit for hunting less noble game. Credit is given for deer skins also, and they were daily sold. One man still preserves the horns of the last deer that was killed in this vicinity, and another has told me the particulars of the hunt in which his uncle was engaged. The hunters were formerly a numerous and merry crew here. I remember well one gaunt nimrod who would catch up a leaf by the roadside and play a strain on it, wilder and more melodious, if my memory serves me, than any hunting horn. At midnight, when there was a moon, I sometimes met with hounds in my path prowling about the woods, which would skulk out of my way, as if afraid, and stand silent amid the bushes till I had passed. Squirrels and wild mice disputed for my store of nuts. There were scores of pitch pines around my house, from one to four inches in diameter, which had been gnawed by mice the previous winter. A Norwegian winter for them, for the snow lay long and deep, and they were obliged to mix a large proportion of pine bark with their other diet. These trees were alive and apparently flourishing at midsummer, and many of them had grown a foot, though completely girdled, but after another winter such were without exception dead. It is remarkable that a single mouse should thus be allowed a whole pine tree for its dinner gnawing round instead of up and down it. But perhaps it is necessary in order to thin these trees, which are wont to grow up densely. The hares, Lepus americanus, were very familiar. One had her form under my house all winter, separated from me only by the flooring, and she startled me each morning by her hasty departure when I began to stir. Thump, thump, thump! striking her head against the floor timbers in her hurry. They used to come round my door at dusk to nibble the potato parings which I had thrown out, and were so nearly the color of the ground that they could hardly be distinguished when still. Sometimes in the twilight I alternately lost and recovered sight of one, sitting motionless under my window. When I opened my door in the evening off they would go with a squeak and a bounce, Near at hand they only excited my pity. One evening one sat by my door two paces from me, at first trembling with fear, yet unwilling to move. A poor wee thing, lean and bony, with ragged ears and sharp nose, scant tail and slender paws. It looked as if nature no longer contained the breed of nobler bloods but stood on her last toes. Its large eyes appeared young and unhealthy, almost dropsical. I took a step, and lo, away it scud with an elastic spring over the snow-crust, straightening its body and its limbs into graceful length, and soon put the forest between me and itself. The wild free venison, asserting its vigor and the dignity of nature. Not without reason was its slenderness. Such, then, was its nature. Lepus, levipus, light foot, methinks. What is a country without rabbits and partridges? They are among the most simple and indigenous animal products. Ancient and venerable families known to antiquity as to modern times, of the very hue and substance of nature, nearest allied to leaves and to the ground and to one another. It is either winged or it is legged. It is hardly as if you had seen a wild creature when a rabbit or a partridge bursts away, only a natural one, as much to be expected as rustling leaves. The partridge and the rabbit are still sure to thrive, like true natives of the soil, whatever revolutions occur. If the forest is cut off, the sprouts and bushes which spring up afford them concealment, 
and they become more numerous than ever. That must be a poor country indeed that does not support a hare. Our woods teem with them both, and around every swamp may be seen the partridge or rabbit walk, beset with twiggy fences and horse-hare snares which some cowboy tends. End of chapter 15